Hello. I haven't spoken in a while. Honestly, I really do want to, especially with the speed paint uploads and such, but I always get them done at such a late time and I don't have the strength to record by then. In other news, we are almost at 29,000. Whoa, that's wild. I've postponed this video for so long. Half of it was because I wanted to give a good time frame for people who watch the animation before I show the time lapse, because with it I'll be showing every hidden easter egg I drew. I also want to make a video for Devil's Deal at some point, but who knows when that'll happen. I am in a constant state of picking up new tasks and immediately forgetting them. On top of that, the new project, you can consider it like a City of Stars sequel. It has a similar theme at the very least. Anyways, on to the questions that you guys asked. What was your favorite scene to animate? My favorite scene in this animation, and across everything I've done so far, is the scene where Q thrusts his hand through the lava wall while holding the shears. I guess it's pretty simple compared to some of the other scenes, but for me personally, that was the most effective in communicating the mood that I wanted to show as well as the connotations it had for that character's intentions. At the time, his wrist movements were also more realistic than I expected it to be while drawing, which was an added bonus. How did you find and arrange the sound effects? All the sound effects are found through YouTube. Though I don't monetize the bigger animations, I try to look for sound effects that are listed as copyright or royalty-free, so that there aren't any complications later on. As I've experienced recently with the finished animation that I wasn't able to upload to YouTube, copyright can get you into some real hot water. For this video, I use the Photos app Sound Timeline Arranger. You can basically drag and drop the audio files and slide them around to play at the right time. The only effects they have, though, are fade ins and outs, so not very versatile. As of late, I've switched more to adding all of the reverb and distortion effects on a sound editor called Cool Edit Pro. Does the audio or the animation come first? How hard is it to get everything just right? Song always comes first, because I build the animation off of the different sections of the music. Sound effects I may add as I'm going or as an afterthought, depending on how I think it would add to a scene. Let me tell you, it can be real frustrating to get the timing right on the animation, especially for faster songs like the Undying video. And this is mostly because of the program, because Windows has a wonderful habit of playing the video preview at a different speed from the exported video. Truly infuriating. I'd finish everything at like 3 a.m., and when it exports, suddenly every frame is lagging by half a second. What was it like adding in all of the different sounds and distortions, like the water and near the end where the song becomes distorted and whatnot? Well, it's pretty fun. I remember all while I was making it, I was like gushing over the sound effects that I was putting in on Twitter. Maybe a little bit too much, but I just like how it adds to the atmosphere of everything. But I only want to add it when it's necessary. So like a lot of parts, it's just the music because that's all I want you to focus on. And others might have like the ambience noise, like that nighttime wind blowing effect. And that's like when I want it to feel more grounded in that actual scene, like you're standing there. And of course, towards the very end, it's just meant to be all chaotic and aggressive. Though there may be something hidden in there that hints at something I plan to do. I don't know. Well, actually, one thing I wanted to mention was that some people are talking about how they really like the water sound that came out when I was doing the, the pan through the lava thing. And that actually, that water sound is the exact same one used when he fell into the water in the beginning of the animation. So, parallels. Did you take breaks and plan the amount of work each session? Would you like to show the storyboard? Planning will never be associated with my name. I unfortunately have no storyboard to show you. This time-lapse video is my entire drawing and brainstorming process combined. That said, I work based on how motivated I feel to make a scene, which can be like a superpower and a major detriment. Because with, say, Devil's Deal and Undying, they only took three to four days because I was ready to draw every scene and I'll admit, obsessed with working. City of Stars took noticeably longer because there were some parts where I really didn't want to draw it either because it was boring or difficult or without direction. Like, I think I actually remember in the beginning where that scene where he, like, stands up 
when he's sitting on the building. I, I hated drawing that so much. It ended up looking nice, but it was so, so boring and tedious to draw every pose to realistically do that fluid movement. For your Undying video, I saw that your animation process leaned more towards straight ahead animating where you completed the whole thing in a linear way. Do you plan out all the scenes previously, like storyboard or written words, etc? Or do you work out the details as you go? When I try making animatics, I plan every little detail out or else I get lost and don't know how to connect everything. To be fair, planning out the animatic or animation is probably what I should be doing. I'm frankly just really impatient. Along with that, I feel like if I plan what to do, it limits how flexible I can be with the impromptu changes in the story. Many of the scenes are thought of right before I started actually drawing said scene. I don't waste time with sketches beforehand either, which is why the animations look so messy. But now that I think of it, I guess you could say it is preconceived. Only that the storyboard isn't drawn out or written, but entirely kept in my head. When it comes to main scenes, I usually think of them while walking somewhere and listening to said song. Funny enough, I'll have an audible aha moment in the middle of the sidewalk and go on with my day. So until I get to that scene, I just remember it. Do you use references for certain frames? I think so, though I have a fuzzy memory of when I've done so. Maybe for things like water, I'll look up stock images to capture the shape correctly. Or for certain locations on the server, I'll pull up screenshots so I can cut them down to their bare bones appearance. For movement, however, I don't think I look up references unless I'm genuinely stumped on how to transfer an action to animation. I think the only reference I looked at for a person moving was when Q was jumping in front of that sunset from one mound to another, because I could not for the life of me make it look realistic. And honestly, in the final product, I don't think I did. But for the rest of them, I usually reference my own movements and how I perceive myself if I were to do that action. Were there any scenes that you initially planned for this animatic but scrapped for whatever reason? It happens pretty often, most of the time because I've forgotten about them. Perks of a mental storyboard. Do you have a thing for waltzes? They seem to pop up a lot in your art. I didn't realize they leaked in like that. I do appreciate dance a lot, though I'm not much of a dancer myself. I think the slow, rhythmic dances especially convey so much emotion. Like, they are what I consider to be the body language equivalent of facial expressions. One day, I hope I can animate those kind of things realistically because it's such a beautiful art form. How do you choose your color palettes and which are your favorites? I rely on gradient maps and color balance a lot. The preset gradient maps on Procreate are something I can fall back on when I want suggestions for a different color scheme. If I like it, I'll make a duplicate of the frame and lay it over the original, adjusting the opacity of the gradient layer to how I'd like it. And color balance sliders are a must in almost all the art I do. I like to slide them everywhere and just see how it looks or if it's necessary. Curves have a similar effect, but they also affect the lightness and darkness of an image. I definitely recommend experimenting with these things while coloring. Even if you don't end up using them, it broadens your perspective so that you could maybe experiment with colors in the future. How do you choose the colors when you want to represent a certain mood in a setting or character? I usually decide based on a scale of how warm or cool I think a scene would feel. Like the desert, for example, is meant to be a hot place, but is colder by the nature of it being nighttime, as well as the context of being in this huge desert alone. I find myself associating cool colors with loneliness very often. Maybe because the cold feels so isolating. So on the flip side, with happy scenes or nostalgia, I prefer warmer, brighter colors. It gives like that feeling of comfort. And I also feel like that's how you would perceive the colors of the world differently if you, the viewer, were in that character's place, feeling what they feel. And then strong reds and such, of course, have like tension behind them. So when I saw City of Stars, the first thing I noticed were the stars and the moon because they bring me a lot of the feeling of northeastern woodcuts. Was it intentional? If not, what did you use as inspiration to make the moon and stars? There definitely was a certain aesthetic in mind. I guess I wanted something that looked pictographic but with some mystical wonder. One thing I can pinpoint, though I don't know if I was intentionally referencing this, was the look of that painting in the artist's log cabin in the woods of the movie Kiki's Delivery Service. 
the one that she made of Kiki. Weirdly specific reference, I know, but I just liked that vibe, and I guess I want to replicate it. I think the stars specifically were also influenced by the look of fairy lights. I actually own star-shaped Christmas lights for my room because I can't get fairy lights myself. Do you have any tips on finding your own art style? How did you find yours? And when you found it, were you happy with it? Even if you intentionally make changes to your art style, some essence of it will always be in every drawing you make. This is because your art style comes from your truest way to draw, I think. It'll be a combination of techniques that you find the most comfortable to use and the art that you enjoy seeing the most. So I guess there isn't a defined point where you find your art style. It will keep changing as you learn new things and experiment. To answer your question, I suppose I like my current art style, though I'm open to trying a different look if I find something new and interesting that I haven't tried before. You should experiment too. Take a look at all the art styles you love seeing and mix and match until you get into a groove where what you make matches your own taste. Now, I don't mean taking every element of someone's art style, because I think if you did that, it would just feel out of place. Like it's not really you, you know? But there's no harm in observing what you like and finding a way to make it your own. Does it bother you if people take inspiration from your style? Like not trace, but more like taking the way you draw eyes, the vibes of your stuff, or in general style. I don't mind at all. It's flattering that people would take inspiration from something I made, just as I've tried to learn from the artist I admire. How do you animate so well and procreate despite the timeline being so confusing? I've tried it, but the way the layers work for each frame is both confusing and a bit limiting. I'm not quite sure if I can provide any helpful advice for this, because it might just depend on like your own process and how you draw things. But for me, I'll use at max like maybe three layers for a frame if I want to like color under and over it. And then I merge everything together afterward. But because of that like onion skin opacity setting that the animator tool has, it can be hard to like see the final image as you're working on each layer because it does convert every layer into a different frame. So for that, I just like constantly toggle the animator tool on and off. Another thing that might be helpful is um, using clipping masks. Because something I found was that if you use a clipping mask to that layer, it doesn't count it as like a separate frame in the animating tool. So like you can have like five clipping masks over the one layer and then it'll all show up like it's that one layer. How do you add audio to Procreate for animation? Okay, I get questions like this a lot, and I think because there's some misunderstanding when I say I make the frames on Procreate and put them together on Windows Photos, because by this I don't mean I make animated sequences on Procreate, I mean I export every individual image from Procreate. So like hundreds and thousands of images take up my photo album and I email them to myself. Every image gets put into the photo's timeline, which lets me add sounds and such. So it's basically like I make a photo album, but it's extremely fast. What helps you stay motivated while working on projects? If I legitimately have an idea for the animation I want to do, it's an understatement to say I'd get completely obsessed. The fact that it's so clear in my head, but doesn't exist yet, irritates me enough to keep going. I'll also try my hardest to stay within the same mindset or mood the entire time. I'd listen to that exact song for the animation like hundreds of times on loop. That way I stay in the same kind of trance. But also it gives me free time to brainstorm other scenes as I hear the different lyrics. So, symbolism. I know there have definitely been questions on the different elements of this, but I'm not going to touch too much on these, since I ultimately want to leave the meaning up in the air for people to interpret. I also find myself agreeing a lot with the meanings you come up with. Sometimes, I wish I had thought of that myself. So in a way, if I never reveal the actual meaning, it's as though everything is canon. Also, with things I want to do in the future, I want to form like a web of videos that are linked together through easter eggs or references to different points in the timeline. I think that would be fun. But I'll touch on a little symbolic stuff. What was the rain falling on Quackity's head during the torture scene? So this is a recurring theme for whenever I draw the cell in that prison, and it's because of the crying obsidian in the ceiling. I have a personal interpretation where it cries more in response to emotional atmosphere or violence. So the fact that it produces a downpour when Q enters the room, take with that what you will. 
What was the meaning of the hue shift in Quackity's eyes? It's important to explain why it was red in the first place. And this was before I even thought of the wither design. The scars I put on characters are not intended to look like any realistic aftermath from canon death or injury. It's always meant to be symbolic, because when the character is reborn after their canon death, I imagine that their bodies are fine, but the scar remains on them mentally, which causes it to manifest in different ways. The size and appearance of Q's scar, which I guess some people interpret as body horror, is meant to show how violent and gruesome the event was when Q got pickaxed. It relies on the fact that the pickaxe isn't really accurate, so in my interpretation, it may not have landed right in the teeth like Techno was planning. How I imagined it, and warning this may sound a little graphic, was that it missed its mark and went straight into the eye. Like a full stab. Because I mean, that's what pickaxes do, right? They're meant to carve in, not slice. So scrape down the forehead, lock into the eye socket, and yank. And this causes his entire face on that side to tear open, which is where the huge scar came from. Even the scar teeth, which are not anatomically correct in their placement, symbolize how exposed that time felt, the utter carnage and simultaneous vulnerability. And so the red eye is an afterimage of how bloody and utterly destroyed it was from that incident. I also see it as a concentrated point of aggression. Because Q definitely has some aggressive moments associated with that time. Anyways, I went on a long tangent. The reason why it changes to blue is because it's like a cooldown. So the aggression has died down, or more accurately, appears to die down. But it hasn't healed. He's changed from that butcher army era, but he's not his old self. If anything, it's a little scarier, because now this violence and malice is blanketed with calm and that makes it unpredictable. It's also influenced by the fact that I was going in the wither direction, and with that glowy effect that the wither has, that's where I get the association with blue. As for his other eye, the blackened one, that one really shows the death of his old self. I associate pre-trauma Q with the black iris and white pupil design, and that light disappears. It gets darker and darker until finally you see that the entire eye is darkened. While previously he had this inner voice to contrast that aggression in the red eye, now both of them are clouded. Was it purposeful for the backgrounds to start getting grayer the later into the animation you got? Every single time that a background color changes within the same scene, it's very intentional, either for mood purposes or a symbolic meaning. So to answer your question, it is tied with the Wither getting a stronger hold of his character. And for the whole Wither design, Can of Worms, you can read that thread on my Twitter. So I see it as though the world is losing color, except it's completely because of his perception of the world. As he becomes more guarded, distrusting, and morally gray, the way he sees the world and its people changes. How do you capture a glimpse of emotion within a single drawing? So I try to hype myself up to feel the same way as the emotion I want to draw. I've legitimately made myself cry in my room, only to be like, yeah, that scene's going in. The expressions are heavily referenced off of my own, and I like sometimes stare at myself in the mirror and like observe how my face contorts. How many frames per second do your animations have? I have no idea. I don't think it runs on any set frames per second. I know that animation programs and stuff can let you view this, but I don't think the Photos app has that function. I'll just draw as many frames as I need for the action to feel complete and adjust the time that each frame appears so it fits within that section of audio. So some scenes have like four frames at 0.1 second each, and some might have 10 frames at 0.05 seconds. So if anyone knows how I can translate that into FPS, I'd love to hear it. How did you make the scare so effective? And what design choices do you think of when you're doing body horror? I think horror does well when you rely on knowing that anything can happen at any time. Because once something throws off your balance or gets you doubting the nature of the story, you become wary of what happens next. That's what I hope to do with that first jump scare of the heartbreaking. Timing is also important, knowing where to lull and where to cut. Like when the heart shattered and the music stopped, I left a few seconds of just silent ambience. And with that, I hope to get the feeling that you're standing there in the quiet night, waiting for him to turn around. And yet it never happens. 
I think it's that break of trust that can make a viewer uneasy. As for the body horror, I guess I just try to think of something that I myself would not want to be afflicted with. Maybe it's influenced by like all the horror stuff I've seen in my lifetime, whether it's like media or games or even some real life images, unfortunately. What parts of Las Nevadas episode one did you decide to include in the animatic exactly? Mostly the last bit with that paper crunch switch to reality. I wanted to replicate that experience because it was just so cool seeing it for the first time. That kind of reality break. Really impressive. I also wanted to show similar aggression to that box throw with the casino chips, so I made that same scene but within the context of the SMP, hence the shears, etc. But funnily enough, half of that rough, fast look was because I was not only rushing, but near delirious while drawing it. This was the night before I scheduled it for the premiere. I didn't know if I was going to finish the animation that night, but then I thought, hey, I want to upload it tomorrow and force myself to power through everything. So after that initial crumple box thing, the rest of that was like completely just improv. And those elements are actually kind of meant to be in a different point in the timeline. So it's not like directly after the bulk of that animation. It takes place a little bit in the future. And because of that, a lot of the elements in the final section were my headcanon slash prediction. Why did you choose City of Stars to make the story around? How I came to that song in particular? I mean, I've had City of Stars and other La La Land soundtracks on my phone for years because I love that movie. It was a very bittersweet story of chasing your dreams, but needing sacrifice as well. And I've listened to that cover specifically for a while. I remember while I was in the middle of making the Undying animation, that song played on shuffle while I was walking somewhere on campus. I listened to it and let my thoughts wander, and then the idea comes in like, what if this song was interpreted under this context? Kind of mentally scroll through the different characters of the SMP, seeing which one fits the lyrics best in terms of their character arc and personality. A lot of times, I want the song lyrics to not only feel like a summary of that character, but also like something that character would say in their heart. And the song, that cover in particular, feels so lonely. So it felt like a perfect fit for the casino. Still in the groundworks, a big vision, but a one-man job. How did you learn animation? Trial and error. That playlist of my animatic uploads is the entirety of my experience slash learning process. I think the best way is to experiment a lot, even if you don't think you'll know how to do it. I've tried to promise to myself that even though I don't know how to draw a scene, I'll always try to do it anyway. Sometimes it succeeds, sometimes it doesn't, and that all contributes to your experience. And that's about it. I hope some of you found this helpful or entertaining, or even just something you can play in the background without feeling too annoyed. Thanks once again for the overwhelmingly positive reception on these projects lately. It means so much to me, and I couldn't do it without you. Until next time, see ya.